Good morning again, once again, to uh, our class in Galatians, and we open up the Word and study. That today is um, Sunday morning, June 11th, and we're going to get into the first half of chapter 5 this morning. Uh, before we do that, so that's like the what the first 15 verses there. But before we do that, we're going to backtrack and just read again chapter 4, because the first part of chapter 5 is really a conclusion to chapter 4. And the, what we talked about last time, the, the contrast. Um, remember, clarity is the... Contrast is the mother of clarity. And uh, so all these contrasts that are given there to distinguish and discriminate between law and grace are given to us to explain why that works. And so then when that works out into the everyday life of uh, flesh versus spirit, that doesn't make sense until you understand what came before it and how our how relation to, to God is, uh, is based on promise or grace, not on works of the law. The works of the law come after the, re the uh, relationship as uh, what Paul's establishing here. And, that's, and that explains why the Jews missed it. So let's go into that. Um, before we do that, we will um, just come into the Lord's presence and ask his blessing on his word today. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us, that you give us grace upon grace, Lord, not because we earned or deserved anything, but we have a, we wake up in the morning finding, Lord, that um, if we look to you, if we choose, Lord God, to, um, to acknowledge you, that we have a right standing with God, our Father. And we haven't done a thing yet for it. We can look back to the day that we were brought into your kingdom, we were brought into your household, and became sons and daughters through faith in, in the, the Son of God who, who did everything for us on our behalf and we can't add a thing to it. We're grateful for that. God, we're grateful for that, that there's nothing we can or must add to it, nothing that we could possibly do to add what you've done to us as you've made us your sons and daughters we can proceed with each day forward, Lord, as though we are your sons, not to try to gain uh, uh, standing with God or position with God, but just to gain his pleasure, the one who already um, calls us sons and has brought us who were far, close, and near into him. We just uh, take us into your hands and we pray that you'd open our eyes and we'll see more of you and have a greater vision to see you that we'll get our eyes off ourselves, but then in that we'll see ourselves, but through your light as you see us. Make our hearts tend tender and hungry for more of you and everything. And we just give ourselves to you. That we'll leave to this place today, <clears throat> having been changed, and be more effective and, and able to be fruitful for you, for your kingdom, Lord, that the world will see and know that you are alive and that you do save to the uttermost the one that calls on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. go to uh, <clears throat> well, let's just get right into let's get right into this uh, we read it last time let's go ahead and read it again chapter 4 and we get into, into 5 and let's see I've got about 3 Who wants to read uh, uh, verse 
first seven verses in four. Lucy, and then eight to twenty, thirty, twenty-one to thirty-one. Did I see John? Chapter four, Galatians. Yeah. Twenty-one. And all right. So Lucy, you got the first section. Yeah. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we are children, we are in slavery <coughs> under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved? by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years? I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. As you know, it was, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if, as if I were an angel of God, or as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What happened to all your joy? I can testify that if, if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? The, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us, so that you may be zealous for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be always and not just, and, and to be so always, and not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the, in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now, and change my tone, because I am perplexed about you. Beginning of verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the, Jerus <clears throat> but the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise, at that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same way now. 
But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Okay. Go back to the... Uh, before we move on, let's kind of summarize here real quick. Uh, back in the first... Okay, the first seven verses there, um, talking about... Um, uh, a child in the home of a, of a father who owns um, uh, the estate, the family farm, or the business, if you will, um, and uh, of which, uh, you know, as he gets older and passes on, it goes to the, to the, um, to the heirs, the sons. And uh, first, first, first uh, heir would be to the eldest of the son, would have first rights. And uh, and this, and he makes this, this statement that uh, and while he's a child, while he's underage, he's no different than than a, than a slave who has no interest in in the um, in the farm at all because uh, he's not related. He's just a worker. He gets a wage. He puts in time. And he gets a wage, and he does he does he's provided for. He has a household. He can support his family there. Um, so it's a little bit more the relationship of a servant. Um, a servant is a better a better word than slave because slave has modern connotations to it. Mm -hmm. But in Old Testament, it's uh, servanthood is somebody who somebody who worked for somebody else. It's more of an employer employee relationship because there's money transferred and um, and, a, and and a person is willing to stay with that relationship. Uh, for life, if he likes his position and he likes it, so so he's a servant. But so the child who's under age, who uh, positionally, as Paul says, owns the place, is is in pra practically speaking, he's just like a slave. He's got to serve. Uh, he can't act as though he owns it because he's under age, and. Uh, uh, the only difference being was when he comes of age, then at, then as owner, then he become then he has full rights of sonship. The same full, what full rights of sons? Verse five. The same right that the son has is the same right that the father has. So everything that the father has, he has, and every every responsibility the father has, he has. So, but that doesn't become a reality until sonship. So what Paul is saying is that. Judaism is like um, the child who has a promise, but it's not realized. He's still the same as, in, this, in effect, he's still the same as, as, as the pagan, as the Gentile, who doesn't have, as far as God is concerned, as far as relationship with God is concerned, he's still the same. He, he has uh, uh, an advantage Paul explains that in Philippians. He got an advantage. He's got the prophets. He's got the scriptures. He's got the sacrificial system that all points to the need and to the promise that if he'll stay true to that and not run off like the prodigal son did and leave all that behind, it, turn his back on it all, and he just waits that the full rights of sonships are his. He doesn't have to do anything except be faithful and be true to who he is by nature by blood, really. Um, but when you want to take things into your own hands and you've got to have it because you've got to get them, then you end up losing and leaving. Um, it reminds me of the story that Josh Baker told a couple weeks ago when he spoke when his little boy, um, you know, he had been promised, um, what was it, a snow cone or something like that at the end of the day or something? Like yeah, that, that if they did this and they, or they waited till after dinner, he would get the snow cone, and his dad, and his dad uh, uh, had came came home, and and, uh, and the little boy like, um, Mom promised as soon as we got home we could have the snow cone. Well, well the way you will, but you you, you got to eat first, the dinner first, and he came home and he did that, and and uh, 
uh, he couldn't wait to get it. So when, when, when it was there, he didn't wait for it to be given to him. He went and grabbed it. It dumped all over the place and it left because he, he just knew that he had a promise. Mom promised it and he wanted it and he was going to have it. And he wasn't. He said he wanted it so bad he didn't wait for me to give it to him. And he ruined it all and it was all gone. It was all over the place. That's a, that was a good illustration of, of, uh, of what we do with God and what, and what the Jews did. They're gonna, they, they, wanted to, uh, they wanted to pretend and act like they had uh, the promise of God at the, at the chosen people, but they didn't let God give it to them. They were going to go get it themselves by their own power and their own strength, by their own, like Romans 9.16, not the man that wills or the man that runs, but God that gives grace. So by their own willpower, by their own efforts, they were going to get it. I'm going to get everything that I've got coming to me, that God has for me. I'll go get it. Instead, you, you know, wait for God to give it to you. And that's, that's a good picture between the difference between law and grace. Um, but when the time had come, so, so the Jew is like the child who's still, uh, although on paper, He's, he's, the, he's the apparent heir, but uh, in the present tense, he's still waiting for the promise. Still waiting. Will you, will you let God give it to you? And here God sends his son on the earth, verse 4, in the right time. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so we might receive the full rights of sons or sonship. Because you were sons, God just sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So now we're no longer a slave, but we are sons. And you also are sons. Us being the Jew, you being the Gentile. Also sons, together, because of God's son. God has made you also an heir. So... Um, there's a picture of, of slavery because of being under what he calls the basic principles of the world, which is the same thing for, for the, to the Gentiles, the Jew being under law. If law is your way to uh, achieve relationship with God, you are in trouble because you won't do it. The, the law, you're going to find that the law indicts you as a sinner. So there's, there's that. And then he goes on to speak about the difference between uh, um, well, let's go to the, uh, the, center, the middle section there. Um, is, is, is Paul kind of throwing up his hands? I, I'm just flabbergasted that you guys since we, since we were there and we preached the gospel to you and, and we explained it to you and the church was established, as soon as we left, then these false teachers came. They discredited us, told you all not to listen to us anymore, just so that they could have you listen to them. So it wasn't about truth. It was about, it was about having sheep, sheep stealing about who's, who's uh, ha having a, fo a flock following them. If it was about truth, they would have agreed with, with us and, and attempted to build on the foundation that we had laid. But because uh, obviously they're, they, that's not their interest because they had to discredit us in order to, in order to build themselves up. That's usually a red flag, isn't it? I was yeah, reading like one of the introduction things that they were trying to claim. They claimed that Paul was not an authentic apostle. And that he was watering things down and getting rid of the law to make it more appealing to the Gentiles. Uh, yeah, that, that might have been their claims. Yeah. So that's what, this is why he's doing this because uh, he doesn't want to put any, uh, he wants to make it more appealing uh, yeah. to the Gentiles. So we have to get, he, has to, he had to get rid of the law. <clears throat> yeah, that would be a um, that would be a real Judaistic. The Judaizers would have thought that mm -hmm. those that wanted 
the new believers to convert to Judaism as part of it. But, but, but as Paul makes clear throughout this whole book, in order to do that, you nullify the gospel. You can't add Judaism to the Christian gospel. It's either or. If you've got this, you nullify the, the finished work of Christ at the cross and you make it null and void. If you are still establishing a righteousness of your own, you, you can't do that. So they're, so they're disingenuous. They really wanted converts to Judaism, not to the church. And that, that's where he's making this. That's why that this book is so very important. This isn't a dispute between different flavors of Christianity. Oh, you're Calvinist, I'm Arminian. Oh, well, let's try to find something that we can agree on. That's not. It's not like that. This is. This is whether. This is between whether you're in Christ or not in Christ, whether you're part of the church or whether you're still part of a religious system that rejected the knowledge of God for the because of the religious. The religious system itself became the God and men's adherence to it. They didn't even follow God himself. God himself said so in the prophets Isaiah and the others. This people worships me with their lips. Their, their far, hearts are far from me. You are of your father the devil. You think you're Moses' kids. You know, it, it's clear. They were not, they didn't have a relationship with, with the God of the Old Testament. <clears throat> and that was demonstrated by what they did with the Son of God in the New Testament. So what, what Paul... Uh, the persecution Paul got and the, and, the, and the defamation he got from false teachers is exactly what Jesus got from the Pharisees, isn't it? So, so Paul, Paul is saying, you, it was laid out clearly to you and you so quickly are turning from that and nullifying uh, the blood of Christ at the cross in order to observe special days and months and seasons and years. I fear that for something I've wasted all my efforts on you. There it is in verse 10 and 11. By the way, uh, Neil Silverberg uh, last year uh, came out with this latest book on uh, uh, strains of Messianic Judaism that, that, are, um, that are really Judaizers. Uh, I forgot what the name of the title is, but I, the last time we were down there, he was in the process of writing that book and doing the research for it. And he was telling me about it, and now I see it's been released. It was released early this year, maybe last year. Um, so you look for that. Neil uh, wrote a book on uh, how so many of the Christians have this romantic view that to be... Um, to keep the, all, let's keep all the Jewish holidays. You know, we, we like doing the Passover because there's so many clear pictures of what Jesus did and how Christ fulfilled this stuff. Every single part of that is a picture of what Jesus did and fulfilled one time only with the blood of the lamb that's slain and put over the doorposts. So why don't we do all the rest of the holidays too, all the Jewish holidays? It'll make us closer to to God if we do those things. And there are some who think exactly that. Well, this book, Colossians, Philippians, are written just to stop that from happening. It's not God's will for us to add belief in Jesus just onto the Old Testament structure uh, of how they observed and, and brought. I mean, it's, it's fine to do um, Passovers. We did them, I did them. I led Passovers for about 10 years when we were in Illinois, um, from the Hebrew, but with Christ as the center, our Christ, our Passover, and showing how that he fulfilled that. Not to, not to have some kind of romantic view of wanting to become um, Jewish converts. And we've seen a few people, have, uh, years, decades past here at the net, that have left and converted to Judaism because of that line of thinking. I could name a few names some of you would know, but I won't on uh, the recording. But, uh, um, but sadly, there's, a, there's an appeal to religion and religiosity with people. Um, just like to some, there's an appeal to licentiousness. Well, we're under grace. I'm not under law anymore. I can do whatever I want, and I'm still under grace. And uh, nobody 
Uh, it's usually not spoken like that. It's usually spoken more something like this. Uh, we're under grace, so I don't have to listen to you. That's your, uh, that's your stand, if that's your standard of how you want to live, good for you. But I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not you and I'm not your disciple. I'm his disciple. So that's, uh, so I've got my standard. You can have your, so that, and that, and, and we, and, 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 uh, and we do that even with, with the teaching of the word. Well, the Lord is my teacher, so um, I'll just uh, listen to what that guy has to do. Yeah. Eventually, those people don't go anywhere at all because there's, they disagree, there's something they're going to disagree with everything about anything and they don't put themselves under under teaching and they try to follow God and they end up trying to be in the world at the same time so there's problems with with that the, 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 the faith of Christ neither leads us into either one of these two extremes of legalism or licentiousness it, when you understand the gospel that you become sons because uh, and the promise is fulfilled and it's a one time for all thing that happens if any man be in Christ he is a new creation the old is passed away the new has come everything changes in that person's life you can point to a time and place when that happened everything changes now I'm a son before I was dead now I'm alive I was in darkness now I'm in the light let's walk in it I have the freedom to walk in the light. Why would I want to go back into darkness where I was stumbling? It was bad for me, but that's not the worst part of it. It was bad for God. Now I get to please God. And why should I want to do that? See, now my perspective changes. So it's about life. There, there is when you understand um, what's happening and what the gospel does to a person, now I'm alive. I was born again. Jesus made that so clear. The picture there, the illustration. To be born means that there is a new life that begins, right? So there's a new life that begins. You're going to live according to what that life is. A dog barks, a cow moves. A child of God wants to know and hear what the Father has to teach him and show him what life is all about. Just like a kid. Turns two years old or so, starts talking. Well, it turns just about one years old and they get to stand up on their own legs for the first time and going from crawling to walking. Then they got to decide which way is it. Well, I want to go that way, I'm going to go down the stairs. You know, I'm going to go that way, I'm going to bump into the cabinet. So then they have to learn how to walk, <coughs> right? And they're going to learn to, which bottles can go in the mouth and which bottles are for wax in the floor. <laughs> and, not, you know, and so you, all of this uh, <clears throat> learning how to elect then comes from people who are <clears throat> older and have been there and doing that. So there's, there's this whole new, you're born into life now is to find out how to live the life according to what you are because of what you are born from and who, what you are born from is the source of a father <clears throat> that's why Jesus said you are of your father the devil not father Abraham who is a man of faith sons of God have a father who is holy righteous pure perfect infinite and he's love all at the same time and that's what they want to become because they want to become like their father from whom they proceeded. But if you don't have the desire to be those things, it just might be because you weren't born from him. And he do, you don't know him as father. You have to be born again, born of the spirit and born from above, or you don't have the relationship with him. When John made so simple and clear, it seems a little bit more difficult when Paul writes about it and he explains it all with Hagar and, 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 uh, and Sarah and these two covenants and the two women. He's explaining it in a way that even a Jew could understand it with his knowledge of all the history that was behind him. And it's just a matter of whether he wanted or not. So you had to be sons. This is where we 
had kind of this diagram of the two different scenarios, the law and the great, the law, uh, then the Hagar and the Sarah thing, where, um, you know, in the, to a Jew, Hagar was all the Gentile nations around him that wanted him dead. They, they, all of her sons became the persecutors of the Jew. Right? And today they're the Arab nations, and the Arab nations are now all Muslim. They've adopted a religion very much on the outside, similar to Judaism. Hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds on the big scales of justice, and then I'll get in. Or, and, and if that doesn't work, one thing I know that will for sure work, I'll be a martyr. So I'll strap a bomb to myself and go in the building and kill a bunch of infidels. Then I'll know I'll get up in there. So that's their, the, this idea of somebody who thinks that he's going to earn and twist God's arm, and then God will owe them eternal life. And by, you're going to put God in your debt by these things. So that, that's the law. And there's arrogance to that. When you really think you're putting God in your debt, there's a horrible arrogance. In, even in even in even in uh, church circles, there's spiritual there's spiritual pride. We got to be careful. We got to remember who who we are and from where we come. Who he is. But here he takes Hagar, and instead of equating Hagar with you know the Arabic nations, you say you Jews are Hagar, and now the Christian who is now related to God by faith, which includes Jew and Gentile. It, concludes people, it includes people who were physically of Hagar and physically of Abraham and Sarah, are both in the church and Christ. So now the distinction between the two is really spiritual and non-spiritual, not physical ge genealogy of this woman, physical genealogy of this woman, that's now changed. Because now we got people who are who are Jew on this side and Gentile on this side. And we got people who are Jew on this side and Gentile on this side, physically. But the real distinction is are you born from above and born of the Spirit? That's where you're going to become a son. So the two distinctions there are that. So um, Let's move into chapter 5 real quick. Chapter 5, I'll read the first uh, 15. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. For freedom that Christ has set us free. We talked about this last time. Free from what? Okay, we're free from something and we're free to something. If you're locked up and you're incarcerated in jail and in prison which I had the privilege of going in yesterday and, and talking to the men that are there and just spent a good part of their life in there. They're looking at a day, some of them will never see it, but many of them are still looking forward, forward to a day when they'll be released and paroled. And that will be called the day of freedom. Freedom from something, but a freedom to something. And that was wasn't that one of the one of the one of the callings of the Messiah to come, Jesus Christ, who quoted Isaiah chapter sixty one when he stood up in Luke chapter four, um, was, was it Matthew chapter four verse eighteen, and uh, for the first time went public to speak who he was. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me; has anointed me to preach the gospel, recovery of sight to the blind setting free the captives. Setting free of the captives, those who were their whole lives captive. Captive to what? The law. The law and to the sin nature. And the sin nature was exposed by the law and it owns it and it controls it. And, uh, and it makes me a slave to sin which makes me hostile to God. So I'm set free from the law, which brings condemnation, because the law just exposes me what I am before God. My, myself can't do, can't do the things that God wants. 
freedom from, slavery to sin, and freedom to something else. When the guy who's incarcerated gets, gets his parole date and he's going to go free, where's he going to go? Did you know that, um, you know, working with the prison system, did you know they won't parole a guy or, or a woman? Whoever said, or any, an incarcerated person. Let's just say that. They won't. They won't parole an incarcerated person unless there's somebody there that will sign for them to say that they're being picked up because obviously they don't have a driver's license right now, and that they have an address where they're going to go to. If they don't have that, somebody that's going to pick them up, and they have an address with, that they can be located at where they're going to. They can't just send them out out the door, open the door, and let. See you later. Glad to know you. They've got to have an address they're going to, or they won't let them out. Yeah, kind of like a sponsor. You know, it could be a mom, it could be a, a you know a spouse. If it's not a spouse, a brother, or anybody. But um, but if it's you know the crack house that they came, that guy arrested in, you know, <laughs> those, uh, and a, or a guy who's a known felon, or a guy who's in a, known to be in a gang, uh, you ain't going out. So you're, you're you're free from something, but you got to be free to something. Even in the um, even in the the worldly pagan prison system, they understand something of that. So I'm free to do what? I'm free to start acting like something that I didn't act like before. A person who's responsible for himself, his choices, and his life, but in this case, before God, <laughs> right? I'm free to do the things that please God and that love, that, that, um, um, that demonstrate love for Him now. The things that, that, that whether well, really His character, when we get to the end of chapter 5 and you say to see the fruit of the Spirit, that's the character of Jesus Christ. Against, and He gets to the end of that list, against which there is no law. See how far apart. The, 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 the spirit of Jesus Christ is from the law. The law can't touch the things of the spirit. There's no law against any of it. In fact, you can't have enough of it. You can't have enough of Christ and of the things that he, the fruit that he produces in you because of uh, who he is. I'm going to finish this up because I have a little passage I want to read to you from from Watchman Nia, this book that really helps put this um, in, in a perspective and it helps uh, illustrate for us. <clears throat> it is uh, chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery, which means putting yourself back under the law, having to get circumcised, keep the holy days and all that stuff. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, now this doesn't mean just um, a physical um, operation that you might want to do with your sons. We had ours circumcised. I hope they're not listening now. <laughs> but uh, but for uh, more for uh, biological reasons, not religious reasons. Uh, so... Right. But if it, but if you're doing that in order to uh, satisfy um, some type of requirement of God, because even in the back of my mind, I know we're not under the law, but but uh, God must have a reason for it. Well, if there's well if there's a physical reason for it, fine. It's kind of like the dietary laws. Mm -hmm. the, the gospel writers tell us that Jesus rescinded the dietary laws, but there's still good reasons for not eating certain things. That'll make you sick. I'd rather have I'd rather eat a fish that's uh, that swims up on top than one that's a bottom feeder, for example. That's right. But undercooked meat and, and the blood that's in the beef is where all the cancer is. If you drain off the blood, uh, the more well done it is, the less likely it is to cause cancer. I found that out in the class I took recently on that. All of that, those are all things that are found in the law. We're not under the law and under dietary requirements, but if you learn, if we learn something about um, about biology, and you, and you just and you just for that purpose 
you're going to you're going to find out that you're you're living pretty much according to what 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 God that's the kind of kind of like the principles that God had set it set for. But it's this is what is with circumcision, you're not going to do anything um, to improve your standing with God. Oh, how can you? You're already in His presence, and you're a son. Christ will be of no value to it all at all if you let yourself be circumcised. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to then obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Neither one can make you be born again. But, what, but, but the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. But remember when he makes that statement, it's what your faith is in that causes you to be born again. Faith itself is just a vehicle, like a straw is just a vehicle. The nutrition is in the drink or in the food, not in the straw. The straw is the faith is just the straw. So when Paul says that, what he's really talking about is the one who our faith is in, which then expresses itself through love, as John said. We love him because he first loved us, and if we love him, we want to do the things that he told, tells us to do. We want to obey his commandments. That's how we know that we love him. You were running a good race, Galatians. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? Somebody got in the way. Now you've been sidetracked. You got on the wrong course. You made a left turn. Get back on the race <laughs> so you get to the finish line. That kind of persuasion doesn't come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that when you understand when Paul says, when you hear my arguments and you understand what I'm telling you, I'm confident that you're going to take no other view than what I'm sharing with you. The one who's throwing you into this confusion will pay the penalty, whoever it may be. Brothers, I'm still preaching. If I am still preaching circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. The offense of the cross and the teaching of circumcision are diametrically opposed to each other. Um, the, the need to um, place ourselves under the law. The cross is an offense to those who are perishing. To the Jew, it's an offense because, it, because he thinks that, that, uh, uh, that the law is of no value to him. As for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole rest of the way and emasculate themselves. That's brutal. Yeah. One of the footnotes says, too, the, the zealots were big-time agitators because they didn't want the, the Jews or Judaizers to even to have anything to do with Gentiles. You know, no matter what yeah. they, if they were Christian Jews or just, you don't have anything to do with Gentiles. So they were putting pressure on them also, it said in the opening uh, of this book. Right. Did I mention the other they say zealots? Yeah. Okay, I forgot. But that's what they were also pressurizing, pressuring them. Yeah. You know, to to, to abandon Paul and any other Gentiles. Yeah. Or, 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 so the importance of teaching, the importance of laying out the gospel and understanding the gospel. Um, that's the only way that you can that you can avoid the two extremes of of of, doc, of doctrinal error which are heresy, because when it takes you away from the centrality of Christ and the finished work of Christ at the cross, now we're, we're into heresy. It's not just disputes among brothers, you know, post-trib, mid-trib, or on-trib. Uh, well, you know, I can see things this way or that way. No, this is about whether the gospel is true or not. You mentioned before, too, I, I was thinking that many Christian churches and Christian cults do the same thing. You, know, you, you will do things our way, and they essentially put their new, new converts under their right. law. It the is way when, we do things. when your particular um, version of Christianity um, discredits all others who are brothers mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. and, 
at best a sect, but yeah, and but at worst the, maybe the beginnings of a cult. Mm -hmm. And we got we've got some of that going on, a lot of that going on. Can I but, ask you a question? You have referred to in the past about like where it speaks in here of emasculate uh -huh. as being cut off, and in in this one it speaks of uh, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you in the same spot. And uh -huh. I looked at that as cut off to the extent they were pushed aside. Or other words, what these other people are trying to tell them to add into uh, what Paul has taught them. Yeah. You know, that to cut them, physically cut them off, not cut off private parts. Let me read to you the footnote here in the NIV Study Bible under chapter 5, verse 12, where it says to emasculate themselves. The Greek word here used to, to is to cut off, um, or which is also used, as, it is translated to castrate. So the word to cut off, to castrate, the same Greek word. What Paul is saying here is um, he's, he's making a word play, but yeah, yeah, in the first sense of that ring, he's saying, yes, I, I wish that they would be cut off. We need to cut these people off from the church. They're not, they're not of us. They're not members of us. But he's kind of, he's, he's giving a, a word play that, um, that obviously um, circumcision is, an, is a ritual that where the foreskin is cut off. So there's a removal of, of, um, of part of the body of the male in, in order to perform that which is representative of the old nature being cut off and that we're different therefore than the gentile who's uncircum those uncircumcised philistines are not allowed into the courtyard of the temple why because their hearts are not right towards god so what he's what he's saying is yeah it is it does mean cut off it does mean castrate Paul is kind of giving a double meaning of that right there. Um, the footnote goes on to say, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul uses a related word to describe the same sort of people as mutilators of the flesh. His sarcasm is evident. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of sarcastically saying mm -hmm. um, both things with that comment. So, um, good question. Good question, but not a lot of time. Not a lot of time. I well, have to wait, watch my new wait till next week. Uh, so we'll do that. It's a good. This is good. Uh, I like it when the when the as we move on and get on. It it's the book is the book of Galatians is getting better because it becomes more practical and and how we actually believe how we're going to live our life and then and then. Um, the dichotomy between freedom and slavery has everything to do with the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. One is slavery, one is freedom. And that, that puts it in a, an entirely different light for us, how we live our life. So we're look, looking forward to that as we're closing out this book in the last, um, in the last um, I don't know, two or three weeks. Well, folks, the clock says we're out of here, so let's pray. And we shall move. Um, we volunteers. John? Father, we do come before your throne in Jesus' name. We thank you for this time that we've had to look into your word. Your word is truth. Your word is life. And Lord, we're so thankful for sending Jesus to set us free from that old nature and from sin and to bring us into life with you, Father. So we just ask now that as we go downstairs that we can worship you in spirit and truth, and that we can just allow you to live your life through us this coming week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.